Parts of this episode of Garden Time were recorded before COVID-19 and social distancing requirements. Judy, what are you doing? Ryan, I'm getting pumped. Pumped for what? I'm getting pumped for a new episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time, and we hope everyone is pumped up and enjoying their garden and the summer. Well, we haven't had our hot temp summer temperatures yet, so this cooler weather is still a great time to be in the garden planting. So coming up in the show today, we'll show you some great foliage colored plants. We'll also show you some plants that are trying to change their colors. But coming up first, Jan's Tips of the Month. Well, it's that wonderful time. It's our time with Jan McNeilan. So Jan, you're gonna show us the lemon yeah, for July. Yeah. So what's going on? I am. Well, there were four, uh, there were four lemons um, maturing, and now we're down to one good one and one slug-eaten one. No. Oh. But the plant itself is doing pretty well. Yeah, very much. Uh, it did have some flowers on it, but it doesn't now. Uh, we're we'll just wait and see. I have been fertilizing it and will continue to do so till we get some more flowers. Um, it works really well to uh, fertilize the gardenias. Wow. So they've been doing well. So fertilizer will <laughs> make a difference. We'll keep working on this lemon huh? or we'll auction it off to the... <laughs> <laughs> well, we we'll love see. Every we'll month. see. <laughs> okay. But there's a whole bunch of things in the vegetable garden. Okay. Um, some issues with insects and diseases and let's take a look. All right. Let's go. All right. So Jan, this has kind of been a little cooler summer for us, and I think there's a lot of things showing up in our vegetable gardens and in our flower gardens. Right. Right there, there's a hollyhock, and if you like hollyhocks, you have rust, and it's not something that's going to bother the flowers any. Uh, so those are the, the leaves that, how they look with rust on them, and I just pick them off at the bottom and they keep going up, but um, I'm not going to not have the hollyhocks. They're beautiful. The other thing is, too, I have a, uh, a gladiola leaf here that has thrips on it, and they're a sucking, rasping insect, so that they go up and down between the filaments in the leaf. And so you'll see these uh, elongated rectangle holes, and that's a thrip. And you'll see it on crocosmia, iris, yeah, yeah. on different things. Right, uh, and it doesn't affect the flower at all. And so uh, it's just something that that's what you're going to notice and mm -hmm. that's what it has. Uh, what else um, you got? I had some green beans in and they got pretty decimated by the slugs that were there. But now they're doing well and they're growing out of it and the newer leaves are fine. So yes, there's been damage there and you can use slug bait or beer or whatever it is that works for you. <laughs> um, but know that it's going to grow out of it. Um, and uh, reduce the population of slugs. Here's uh, some potato flea beetle. This mm. is on a potato and also some damage from slugs. Uh, and then again, it's beginning to grow out of it. And, and my potatoes are almost ready now. So in the long run, uh, it's not an issue. It just looks bad. Uh, it doesn't affect the fruit. No. The uh, well, it can if they build up enough. You can get the larval stage in the uh in the soil mm -hmm. and they'll do some wire worm type damage um, you know, on the potato. This is a male squash blossom, a zucchini blossom. And the question always arises, I have blossoms and I don't have any fruit yet. And what it is is that the male blossoms come out first and until the female blossoms come out, which is later and they're down farther on the plant, um, then they, they don't pollinate each other. So you have to wait till maybe a few drop off and fade away until the female blossoms come along and then you'll start to see the fruit coming. Right, so don't worry. No, uh -huh. no. And then I have some um, hydrangea leaves that had some problems and so what is this? It's just fried from the, from the hot days that we had and not enough water. And so on that shrub there, though, the damage is down farther. So it happened at a certain point, and yeah, it's also what, growing out Yeah, how many it. weeks ago we had 90-degree weather, right. and that's when it happened. Right. 
and all these things. I mean, that's part of growing a vegetable garden, a flower garden. And sure. so don't give up and just kind of move on, pick off the bad things and, and just kind of move on and enjoy. Right, right. I, and what I've also uh, noticed is that uh, there's a lot of mildew that's potential mildew on the nine bark shrubs. Mm. We're seeing uh, powdery mildew in, in areas that aren't very well ventilated. Now I have one plant that looks horrible and I have another plant that gets lots of air circulation and it's fine. So it just depends on where it is. Too. Right. So that's a clue of where you're placing things. Sure, too. sure. And so I think I'm taking one out and hoping the other one survives and we'll go from there. Otherwise it's not worth, I mean, you could spray during the year in the dormant season and try to keep it from, and as the new growth comes out, but uh, it may not be worth doing that. Yeah, it's, you know, there's always something. I mean, it's it's nature. Yes, yeah, <laughs> always. Well, it's fun to be able to identify what it is that's exactly. doing the damage. Right. Um, I also um, noticed that the my cucumbers this year are very slow. Mm. And it's a lot to do with, like you were saying, cool evening temperatures. And once those evening temperatures get to be higher, 50, 55, then they'll take off. Mine are starting to, but the boy, they just have been sitting there. Mm -hmm. The squash doesn't seem to be bothered by it, but the cucumbers really have re um, reacted to the cold. You know, I think you've answered so many questions because we've been getting questions into the Garden Time website. So we're all out in our gardens and we're seeing these kind of problems. And so we have a new Facebook page to look into and Jan has it. So I do, I have a, I set up a Facebook page to help with the garden tip segment on Garden Time. And also just, I miss teaching, so I th thought I would set myself up to answer some questions. So it's Jan's PNW Garden Tips. Ah, so you can go to Garden Time, um, our website or Facebook page, and you can kind of find hers. And so get so all of those questions answered and have a wonderful garden. Enjoy it. Thanks so much, Jan. You're welcome. See you next month. See you next month. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. So for the parts of your life that just can't stop, it's essential to keep moving forward safely. And now it's easier than ever to own a brand new Subaru from Capital. Not only can you shop hundreds of Subarus online and get questions answered instantly, but now you can test drive, finance, and even complete your purchase all from the comfort of your home. So keep planning for the future. We'll be here to help make the road ahead just a little bit smoother. Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Build a beautiful home inside and out at French Prairie Perennials. Inside, we have just the right creative elements to complete your decor. We offer an oasis of unusual, nature-inspired garden and home gifts and accessories. Outside, choose from our wide selection of unique dwarf conifers and sparkling companion plants. French Prairie Perennials, located between Woodburn and Wilsonville. Take exit 278 to Aurora and French Prairie Perennials. We love to come to Out in the Garden Nursery in Malala with Carol. And Carol, you always have different plants for us, and this time you have all different textures and colored foliage. Yeah, I'm, I'm a foliage person. Um, this is actually more shrubs than we usually have for me, but there's a lot of wonderful things. It's not all about flowers. Um, flowers are great, but a lot of the foliage is much more endearing and long-lasting in the garden than a flower. So um, we've got some new, like they're new for me, but I'm really liking them. This is Red Baron Physocarpus, which is a nine bark. I also have one called Darts Gold. 
Um, they're larger shrubs, six by six. Um, they do have white flowers, but they're fairly insignificant compared to the foliage. And they sometimes do a berry set too that the birds really do like. Nice, and that, that's and this, pretty. This is um, a wagelia. It will end up with nice, big, bright, trumpety pink flowers. The hummingbirds really like it. But that beautiful foliage all year, and it's black, minor black is the cultivar on that one. It's about a three foot high and wide plant. And these are sun? These are all sun, yes. And then you have a whole bunch of elderberry. Yes, I love the lacy. So this is lemony lace, this is black lace. Um, this one's labeled to be about six feet, but I'm not going to necessarily believe that. Um, the black lace can easily be eight to ten feet. Um, they're lovely. They're fairly drought tolerant once they're well established. They make a great backdrop, backdrop in the garden. Um, we have a hedge of the black lace. It's a wonderful plant. And when it's in bloom, it's all pink flowers. It's, very it's pink gorgeous. Flower. Yeah, this yeah. one is white and this one is pink. Carol, what about a shorter Sambucas? Because these are kind of big. I have these other ones. These are still, they're compact in the, in the world of Sambucas. They're still three to four by six feet tall, but they are a little tighter. You can see this one's laced up. It's a much tighter growth habit. Um, this is Black Tower. It's got the broader foliage, but it's actually a really nice contrast as well. And they take hedging really well. They do. Like they actually take pruning extremely well. Yeah, very well. nice. And then this one is a cool one. What's this is that? a nice little Osmanthus. This is Goshiki. Um, so it's multicolored all season. The new growth actually has some pink and red in it, so it's got multiple colors. Um, they're slow growing. They're drought tolerant, sun or shade. Uh, really nice addition. And at some point as they mature, they'll actually have a fragrant flower in the fall. Wow, wow. And a new Nandina. I don't this know. This is that a one. really nice one mm -hmm. called Bonfire. And what I like about it is that it changes all through the season. So the new growth is bright red, then it will turn green, will hit winter, the whole plant will turn bright red, will hit spring, it goes back to green, new growth, and it repeats. So it's just a really nice, it's a three foot, fairly compact nice ones for mostly sun. Yeah, even a container. Yeah, it would be nice in a container, nice. absolutely. And a couple more. And then we have some shade plants. So this is um, a Cuba. This is Gold, Mr. Gold Strike. Um, this will eventually be about a six by six plant. It's evergreen, it's drought tolerant, and it's shade tolerant. So it's a really oh. nice, um, it's a nice evergreen that will brighten up a dark shady spot. And then we have, of course, a couple of my absolute favorites. So this <laughs> is Aurelius Sun King. Um, it's an herbaceous perennial. It will get four feet high and wide in a season. I love to pair it with big blue hostas or some of the big variegated hostas. It's really lovely with that. And then this is Ligulari. This is barbecue bananas. It'll make a three by three um, mass of foliage as they get older. Um, and it's just another really beautiful um, bright color for the garden. Very cool. And there is a special thing going on this weekend. This weekend is our annual Cascade Nursery Trail Midsummer Madness. So um, all seven people of the Cascade Nursery Trail will be open. Um, so you can go from nursery to nursery and visit the gardens, great people. Um, gardens look amazing this year because of this weather. And then we all have huge plant selections because of the way this season has gone out. So it'll be one of the best times to come and see us. Uh, and it's really great weather to garden it's in perfect. because it's not that blazing hot mm -hmm. and dry and it's just been really great. Yeah. So please go to gardentime.tv and get all the information about where you can go this weekend and get some great plants. Carol, thanks so much right. and have a great time. Right. Thanks, Judy. So our tip of the week is how to remove those pesky fir and pine needles from our lawn. So after you've already mowed through, you're still left with a lot of those needles that have been kind of you know, stuck down in the blades of the grass. So a good tip is to go and take your garden rake, and the old rake will do, and you can just kind of fluff up the lawn. And what it does is it pops those needles up to the top. So you can either rake those all the way out or go back over with your lawnmower and suck them up. And then your grass will be nice and fluffy and ready to walk on for the rest of the summer. And that is our tip of the week. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery. A passion for plants. A nursery for plant people. Do you want to be green? Do the easy stuff first. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. The U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee says for every dollar spent on a shade tree, you can save five dollars on cooling, blocking the penetrating heat in the summer and allowing the warm rays through in the winter. Dollar for dollar, there's no better energy and money saver than a good, deciduous shade tree. Portland Nursery's professionals can help you make the perfect selection. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. You can use water wisely this summer with these simple tips. Periodically, check your watering system to make sure it is working correctly. 
tighten hose connections and adjust sprinklers to water plants and not the pavement. Give your lawn and garden a deep soak twice weekly instead of watering daily. Skip the fertilizer until the fall and mow your lawn less often. Taller grass holds moisture in longer between waterings. Get more WaterWise gardening tips at regionalh2o.org. Dram is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. Dram products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. Dram for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Come to where the color is. Come to Egan Gardens. We've worked hard growing healthy plants for you so that your gardening is easy. Add sparkle to your garden with our perennials, container plants, and skillfully designed baskets and planters. Stop and get a mood lifter out here on the farm. We have lots of fresh air and lots of space. There's lots of blooming plants, new vegetable starts, shrubs, and berry bushes. Egan Gardens, where it's all about the plants. We're located west of I-5 at exit 263 on River Road. Well, I'm out here with Carlene. We're at a Sagala Nursery. Carlene, we're talking house plants today. You know, there's been a resurgence of house plants and people's interest in that in the last couple years. Mm -hmm. But there's also people that are a little bit intimidated about how to get into house plants and what to do. But you know, today you brought some great you know starter house plants of uh, how to get into it. So what, do we, what do we need to look at for for house plants? So if someone were to come into the store and said, where do I start? I would definitely say right here. We have some Sansevieria snake plants. We have some succulents down here, and we have some cactus on this side. This is a wonderful place for people to start. The Sansevieria comes to us from East Africa, a very okay. arid region. It grows on a rhizome. So in terms of water, I might water a snake plant once every eight weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then the succulents, they need a little bit more water. I might water a succulent once every four weeks. Okay. And then the cactus, I think it's important to remember that in their natural environment, they only receive two to three inches of rain per year. Right, I mean, they're in the, so, in the desert, right? Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's, right. Yeah, so if you wanna mark your calendar and water those cactus once every quarter, that's a great place to start. Okay. Uh, these uh, um, succulents, they do need a little bit more light. So if you have that south or east facing window indoors, this is a great location to put all of these plants. Okay. And okay. if the culture is met with the cactus, they do have some magnificent flowers. Right, I've seen some yeah. of those real, real pretty hot oh, pink yeah. blooms on them. Brilliant, beautiful colors, just right. fantastic plants to grow with minimal care. They do like, however, a very arid, sort of porous soil. Okay. They don't want a soil that's going to retain a lot of moisture. So it's important to get a good cactus mix with these particular okay, house to get, plants. To get that drainage. Yeah, and then when you're you know, doing a container like this that has the mixture, it's probably mm -hmm. important to make sure you're picking the right plants to go yes. in, that, in that mixture that all have similar growing conditions. Yes, you want the same culture for these plants. The nice thing about this container, I do have succulents here that need more water than these other two plants. You can spot water them specifically, so you're not watering right. the whole container Because you have sizable enough where you could do it. Yes, That's a good, good, exactly. good tip to remember Exactly. That. But then if you also didn't want to do a mixed container, you could also do, do them in an individual little pot Yes, too. you could. As you can see here, I have some examples of a succulent just in its own pot and cactus as well. They make great little window sill plants, right. you know, pop a color. You know, something you can nurture if you don't want a pet, you get right. home, come home and see your plant on the right. window. Make so. a little, you know, great on the little desk or yeah, or just absolutely. Make, or make a little great little hostess gift. Too, yes, right? absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, if people aren't, you know, into the, like the succulent or the real arid drought tolerant and wanting to go more kind of that leafy top, tropical look, yeah. you know, you have a couple of the, here that, that I can do. do that too. The, I would definitely start if I was brand new to house plants and wanted something with a more tropical look. I'd start with the Spilatheum, the Peace okay. Lily. Uh, it has just be beautiful, vibrant green foliage and these really elegant white blooms. It does like a little more light, so okay. you wouldn't want to put this in shade of any kind. Bright ambient light is the best. It can take some direct sunlight, but I would recommend morning sunlight and okay. not that hot afternoon sunlight. It does like more water. I probably water this one in this three inch pot probably once every four days. Okay. The nice thing about the peace plant is that when it's thirsty, you'll know, because it'll it's, start it's to gonna, wilt gonna, right it's over. It's gonna start drooping yep. down. But so. the nice thing about it too, is that once you get that water on the plant, it just comes right back. 
And the other thing that's nice too about this white bloom is that if you fertilize every other time you water, it will bloom for you the entire growing which, season. Which is a which great yeah, trait to have. Absolutely. Have that, so. so if you have a nice, you know, white sort of neutral decor, this is an right. excellent plant. And then the other little guy right there. Yes. And so I have this little Chinese evergreen. This one is called Hot Pink Valentine. Yeah. It's also a really great place to start in terms of tropical foliage. It does require some more water like the peace plant does, uh, but they don't want to be overwatered. So gotcha. if you let this dry out between waterings, that's the best thing to do with this. And I've noticed too, when I put this in my windowsill at home, the more sun that it gets, the more vibrant the modeling on the leaves. Oh, yeah, so definitely a sunny sort of location, get some direct sun in the morning, okay. be just fine for this okay. plant. So I appreciate being out here with you today out at Sagawa Nursery. You, know, you can come out, visit your knowledgeable staff. You know, for more information, you can come out here to the nursery, you can go to their Facebook page, you can go to your website, mm -hmm. or you can go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you open. So thanks for having us today, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. You may have a variegated plant in your yard that's as green and white or golden variegation. And you might notice on some of them that it's starting to turn green in spots. This is pretty common. What it does is the plant is reverting back to its original parentage. So variegated plants don't typically occur in nature automatically. So what it's doing is it's going back to what it used to be. So you'll start seeing these green patches coming out in the variegation. And if you left these in there, the green is a little bit more dominant and will eventually take over all your variegation. And so when you see that in there, you'll want to cut out those straight green pieces and then you'll be left with your variegated plant that you enjoy for years to come. At Sagawa Nursery, we always talk about taking your garden from ordinary to extraordinary. For us, that means bringing you the newest and best plants and unique garden items to you, our customer. For you, that means we'll help you transform your garden into something that's extraordinary. We also have some great gift items and even a few surprises for inside your home too. Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. Since 1982, the wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, the wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Nestled in the oaks of the Willamette Valley is a nursery that is truly exceptional. At Out in the Garden Nursery, you will find a vast array of shade plants, ornamental grasses, and hardy perennials. Join us this weekend for the Cascade Nursery Trail Midsummer Madness. Enjoy a beautiful day in the country. We offer over 100 types of perennials. Plus, we offer the best in personal attention. Out in the Garden Nursery, where we grow great gardens one plant at a time. but I am at the compost facility at Grimm's Fuel with Jeff Grimm and Jeff about a year ago we were here and none of this compost was here it was like the beginning of this facility that's right welcome back <laughs> when you were here a year ago we had we've changed our uh, composting methods completely in that oh. time originally when you guys first started coming out we were doing the static pile composting method where we just kind of basically you know stack stuff in right. a big pile let it th sit there for four and four to six months. We'd push it a couple times to aerate it, and then we'd run it through the screen, sell the compost after that. That was kind of became a problematic system, so we've switched over to the aerated composting system, where we have beds. We've made this, constructed this big bed. Last time you were here, it was empty and just kind of in construction. Right. Um, it's 220 feet long by 110 feet wow. wide, and the compost is 13 feet high. We fill one of the zones, there's eight different zones. We fill the zones, leave it in zone one, for example, for 15 days. Wow. We rewater it, we move it over to zone four where it sits for another 15 days. And then after it's sit, been on the air for a month, we then take it over to the screens and we'll screen it 
let it sit for another uh, 30 days curing. It doesn't really need to be cured that long, but it's uh, it's good to, to well, get that cured. That's done. half the time as before. Yep, exactly. That's amazing. And it smells like my garden. It smells earthy. It, there's no bad odor, composty odor. Yeah, that was the goal was to minimize the odors and the impacts on the neighbors. So yeah, we've spent a lot of money on accomplishing that and we're really happy with the results. That's great because you're even expanding. You have a phase two. Yep, this is phase one. This is do uh, theoretically 50,000 tons of yard debris a year. Wow. Uh, the next phase is exactly the same. Uh, it, it'll do another 50,000 tons for a theoretical maximum of 100,000 tons a year. Ah, well, there's a lot more gardeners in the area, aren't there? That's so right. You have to get them. Especially this year. It seems like everybody's a gardener. Yeah, definitely. Well, this is just amazing. It's just so fascinating to see it all working because we have compost piles at home, but, you know, they're this big. And it's the same procedure. You want to water it, turn it, aerate it, feed it. That's right. It's all about controlling the parameters of the old static pile. We were unable to control those very well. You need oxygen, you need moisture, and you need to have adequate temperatures in a good composting pile. So we add a lot of water with the sprinklers. We blow a lot of air up through the system. Uh, eventually, we'll have the capabilities to suck air through the system so that it's, you know, get more even heat distribution in the pile. Wow. So it's about controlling those three parameters. And it's hard to do in a home composting yeah, facility. Yeah. I mean, it's such a small area. It's really right, hard right. to generate the heat. Yeah, but it is the most cool thing. I mean, this is state-of-the-art um, facility. It's really so cool. And we'll have all kinds of photos. And if you have any other questions, please go to the Garden Time website. You can click over. They have a newsletter, blog, Facebook, and all that information. But um, you really need this kind of compost for your garden. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks for coming by. Thank you for watching Garden Time today, and we hope you all stay pumped up and enjoying your garden the rest of the summer. And for more information on today's show or any other episodes, make sure you go to gardentime.tv. And we can't wait to see you next time. Parts of this episode of Garden Time were recorded before COVID-19 and social distancing requirements. Judy, what are you doing? You said to follow you. Follow us on Facebook. Oh, man. Well, we invite all of our viewers to follow the Garden Time page on Facebook. And on our Facebook page, you'll find links to stories, you'll see upcoming events, and you also might even find a funny joke or two. So don't forget, go to the gardentime.tv webpage and click the link for Facebook. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.